Tonight, five days of hearings begin for Inu children in care and honoring Derek Bragg, the late MHA for Fogo Cape Friels, who passed away today. This is CBC Here and Now. Good evening and welcome to Here and Now. A Newfoundland and Labrador cabinet minister known for his straight shooting style and sense of humor has died. Derek Bragg's passing was confirmed by Premier Andrew Fury early this afternoon. Here in Nesmar Quinn has our top story. Just seven months after announcing he'd been diagnosed with cancer, Derek Bragg has died. Bragg was 59 years old. Today, Premier Andrew Fury released a statement offering condolences. It's with a heavy heart that I acknowledge and honour the passing of the Honourable Derek Bragg, he said. Bragg was born and raised in Greens Pond, where he was the town clerk and manager for three decades and fire chief for 28 years. I still remember uh, a little boy sitting in my classroom, probably in nine, grade nine or ten, with a big smile on his face. And, uh, not realizing, I suppose, at the time that uh, he would be instrumental in moving the province uh, forward in a, very, in a, in a portfolio like, like the fisheries, for example, or municipal affairs. Herbert Burry is the mayor of Greens Pond, a community where Bragg maintained deep connections. Uh, it's, it's kind of interesting, the number of people that, you know, he, um, he, he touched by his by the way he spoke and by the way that he just listened to you and sometimes the way that he fought with you. Uh, but, uh, you know, I remember the little kid, as I said, big grin on his face. You know, you wonder sometimes if he was laughing at you or at something that you said or something that you did. Bragg was first elected as MHA for the district of Fogo Island, Cape Friels in 2015 with then Liberal Premier Dwight Ball. He served in cabinet in many positions, first as the Minister of Municipal Affairs and Environment, and most recently as the Minister of Fisheries, Forestry and Agriculture. A straight shooter, Bragg never shied away from controversy, like when a dispute over crab prices brought fishermen to the House of Assembly last spring. Well, I don't exactly expect a round of applause. So it's not lost on me that 220 is one crappy price. He had a flair for speaking plainly and forcefully inside the House of Assembly too. And I could barely sit in my seat here today. I'm that excited for our enforcement officers in Labrador. My friend compared poaching to bingo one time. You play long enough, you win. You poach long enough, you will get caught. The Premier lauded Bragg for his unwavering belief that Newfoundland and Labrador's brightest days are still ahead. Bragg made that clear with his words and actions. And as you can see by these fields, there's a great potential here. Mark Quinn, CBC News, St. John's. One person has died and two others were seriously injured in a fiery two-vehicle crash. The RCMP say it could be related to impaired driving. It happened on the TCH near Arnold's Cove yesterday when an SUV and a car collided head-on. A 22-year-old passenger in the car died at the scene. The car's driver has life-threatening injuries and bystanders pulled the driver of the SUV from his burning vehicle. Police believe the 71-year-old man was showing signs of impairment and say officers are investigating. Well, healthcare workers continue to deal with a dramatic rise in the number of invasive strep A cases here and across the country. There were 52 infections in the province last year, more than double the year before. Doctors say it can turn fatal quickly, but it does respond well to antibiotics, especially if it's caught early. So if somebody gets very sick very quickly, it should be on someone's mind um, to, to think about this. Um, more specifically, if, um, if it, a child had a fever for five days or more, they should get checked. Um, if somebody's got a full body rash that uh, can sometimes look like a sunburn, um, it's that, that can be a sign of group A strep. Alternatively, some people get a full bo body rash that's, um, that feels a bit like sandpaper. Mm -hmm. So that's something to look for. Um, if it's a child and they're not eating or drinking or very sleepy, that's, that's also a potential sign that something bad is going on. 
Memorial University says it's too soon to predict what the federal cap on international students will mean for this province. Ottawa has said it will reduce the number of visas by as much as 50 percent from numbers in 2023. The size of the reduction will depend on the province or territory. Memorial says international students are heavily involved in research and are disproportionately involved in business startups. In a statement today, a spokesperson said in the last month alone, international students uh, have been in the media for everything from improving post-stroke recovery using AI to launching the first ride-sharing service in our province. And Ottawa plans to reduce the number of student permits over the next two years. Just last month, the immigration minister said he hopes to target, quote, the diploma equivalent of puppy mills. Today, he said the cap is meant to take action against some small private colleges who've been taking advantage of international students. Be absolutely clear, these measures are not against individual international students. They are to ensure that as future students arrive in Canada, they received the quality of education that they signed up for and the hope that they were provided in their home countries. It would be a disservice to welcome international students in Canada knowing not all of them are getting the resources they need to succeed in Canada and having them return home disillusioned and disappointed in Canada's education system. Now, the College of the North Atlantic agrees it's far too early to say what this will mean for students in Newfoundland and Labrador. The college has 671 international students registered this year. That's about 10 percent of the student population and double what it's seen in previous years. Well, a big weekend for hockey player Maggie Connors at the Professional Women's Hockey League. For the pass to Leslie, circles back. Some help from Connors and she scores! Maggie Connors has been waiting for her moment. And what a first BWHL goal for the pride of Newfoundland. Absolutely. The 23-year-old from St. John's scored her first career goal Saturday night against Montreal. A big moment for the youngest player on the team. Uh, not long after that, Connors took a big hit against the boards. But uh, any pain was uh, soon forgotten when she made her first assist. Toronto went on to win 4-3 over the weekend. Congratulations, Maggie, on a great game. Well, the Newfoundland Rogues' third season is off to a perfect start. The Rogues took both games over the weekend against the Jamestown Jackals at the Mary Brown Centre. On Friday, the Rogues took down the Jackals 122 to 112. On Saturday, the visitors from upstate New York didn't put up much of a fight, and the Rogues easily took the win 120 to 98. The Rogues now have a record of two wins and no losses, and will welcome the Kingston Waterloo Titans to town on Thursday for a three game series. A couple of newcomers to Carboneer have already made their mark on the community. The town clock had been out of commission for decades. But thanks to a Ukrainian watchmaker, those hands of time are ticking once again, all less than a month after arriving with her husband to live with their daughter in Conception Bay North. <laughs> This was a building we say that was the old post house in Carabineer. In 1904, uh, she uh, she burnt, and of course uh, in 19, I think it was 1906, it was uh, rebuilt, and uh, that's when the clock uh, uh, was put in the tower. She's 117 now. The last time I can uh, find out, I think it was in 84, 84, 88. That's how long that, that it hasn't been working. Last year, I went up and I clocked myself and tried to get it working. I got it working for about 10 minutes or so, but I couldn't figure out some, some sort of stuff. So I went on YouTube and I just couldn't decide on, on how to get it going. I was talking to Keith Thomas, he's the president of the Heritage Society, and he was telling me that um, uh, he was in contact with Julia and her parents were going to come down and say, well, that'd be great. So luckily uh, her parents came over, showed me a few things, and now, now she's working. I started planning for them to come here and we had a big problem because they refused to come. 
because all the time they told us what will we do there <laughs> we will be bored we don't know what to do and i was talking about that with my friend from carbonier stephanie and she tagged me under this post of uh, heritage society and she was like Julia, this is the possibility of keeping your parents busy they came on november 25th and i gave them only a week to rest and then i brought them here побоялася сказала що надо подивитися тому що старі часи не знаю що там коли я приїхала і подивилася я їм сказала що попитай зробити she said uh, i was in ukraine at that time First, I was afraid to promise something because I didn't know what is inside of the clock. But I told that I will come and check. As soon as I came and saw the clock, I, I told them I will fix it. <laughs> when uh, your parents came around, they, they said it was going to be uh, four or five days. And they said, uh, do you want to uh, fix for New Year's? I said, it'd be great if it is, but no pressure. When she came and she only took uh, four hours to get it going, and I said, it was great. I was absolutely ecstatic to know something that was still for so long could be fixed, <clears throat> did get fixed. I couldn't thank uh, Yulia and her parents enough for what they've done for the town of Carabinier. And it fell right in around Christmas time. So I guess you might say there's a little bit of a Christmas miracle. All the people are so wonderful. They wish good luck wish uh, the house for my parents, God bless you, and you know. But lots of people, they are writing something like, we are proud of new Canadians who are coming to become a part of our community. And uh, people are proud of my family, and I'm proud as well. And finally, people really appreciate their talent. And I'm really happy that in their life, they are appreciated so much, so it's like, very wonderful feeling. Well, in the weather forecast, we have some extreme cold through Labrador in the overnight through Wednesday. Temperatures as cold as minus 45 are possible. We'll tell you all about that, plus some snow in the forecast.
Kluckner is here now with a look at the weather. And uh, it was a cold one in St. John's, but I feel like I cannot complain when we look at what Labrador is going through and especially what's coming up for them weather-wise. That's right. So it's not super cold there yet, but it will be tomorrow morning, like tonight and in, into tomorrow. Uh, so these are the areas that we, Environment Canada has issued an extreme cold warning for. So Labrador City, Wabush, Churchill Falls, and Nain. And we could see temperatures nearing minus 45 with the wind chill. And the extreme cold warning is out because there could be a risk of frostbite to exposed skin within minutes. And of course, hypothermia as well. The dangers of really, really cold temperatures. Please bring people and pets inside and make sure someone and everyone has somewhere warm to go when the temperatures get that cold. We'll talk a little bit more about that later, but take a look at our current temperatures first. Not so bad across the Big Glen. Minus 11, minus 12 in Lab City, Churchill Falls right now, and minus 15 in Nain. Uh, minus 9 for southern parts of Labrador. Here on the island in the east, minus 2, minus 4, minus 5. A little chillier through central, and minus 2 to minus 6 uh, in the west coast currently right now. But let's talk about what's going to be on the way into tonight and tomorrow. We will see some snow and some flurries across the island. It'll be more like snow for the southwest and west coast. We have that extreme cold warning through parts of Labrador and then the flurries and the cold that will continue tomorrow. Taking a look at our future tracker now, we see the southwest west and parts of the northern peninsula will see some uh, some snow and some flurries there and across parts of lab city and uh, lab west as well pushing through to happy valley goose bay we're going to see some of this push right across and by midnight we will see uh, some of that snow and flurry activity move into central Newfoundland and then eventually to the eastern part of the island by the early morning with some flurries here for uh, the central and south part of Labrador. And taking a look at the winds, the winds are going to pick up a little bit. Currently about 40 to 50 for many parts of the island, 60 to 65 for Daniels Harbour and St. Anthony right now, and a little gusty for Rigolette and Mary's Harbour. But as we go towards the nighttime, towards midnight, we'll see the winds pick up a little bit, especially for Port of Basque and Burgio here on the south coast to 60. We could see 65 uh, or 60 for uh, Twillingate, Lumsden, Gander, and that's going to push on through to the east part of the island there as well as, as all of this cold and snow comes our way. Taking a look at our temperatures for tonight. For St. John's and the Avalon, minus three, some flurries, some flurries for the Buren Peninsula as well at minus two, minus six, minus seven through central Newfoundland uh, with some flurries possible as well. A little warmer for the west coast at minus three for the southwest coast and in through Corner Brook with your winds gusting to 50 pretty well uh, for many parts uh, in the island as well. But as we get into Labrador, minus 10 for the Straits and Happy Valley Goose Bay, cooler in Nain at minus 17. And look at this, Lab City, minus 31. And that will bring your very cold wind chill values uh, in the early morning and the overnight tonight. Let's take a look at those wind chill temperatures. Here you see it for Lab West, minus 46 at seven o'clock tomorrow morning into the minus 30s for Nain and Makovec and into the minus 20 for Happy Valley Goose Bay and Cartwright. For the island, your, your values will be between minus nine and about minus 13. So it'll still be pretty cold as well. And tomorrow evening, we're gonna see more cold move across Labrador, minus 46 still there with the wind chill and Happy Valley uh, Lab West, minus uh, 36 for Happy Valley Goose Bay. Excuse me, minus 43 for Nain there and into the minus 30s there on the coast. So it's going to be a really cold one tomorrow evening throughout Labrador. Everyone will pick up a, a little bit of snow as well that I was just talking about and we'll see a little bit more accumulation here along the west coast. Take a look at our future tracker for tomorrow now. We'll see some of that snow move out of Labrador and some clearing there. Still with some snow for the west coast and a little bit here for the northern part of the island as well. Tomorrow, taking a look at our temperatures. Zero and one for the Avalon and Buren Peninsula and parts of the south coast. A little chillier uh, and below freezing at minus one into central Newfoundland and cooler yet again for the west coast and northern Newfoundland. As we get into Labrador, this is where we'll see the really cold temperatures temperatures that we were talking about, minus 29 in the west and into the minus 20s for Nain and Makovic, a little warmer for coastal Labrador. Taking a look at our five-day forecast now, uh, we are going to see some flurries, some sun,
sun and cloud flurries, sun and cloud flurries, oscillating back and forth to the rest of this weekend. Same thing for central Newfoundland, a little bit more flurries there in western Newfoundland uh, through midweek and into Labrador. Our temperatures will be quite chilly for Western Labrador Tuesday, warming up a touch for Wednesday, Thursday with some cloud and some sun in your forecast for Friday. Eastern Labrador, not looking too bad. And uh, I am going to leave you with this photo. We're talking about so many uh, cold temperatures that I'm gonna leave you with a beautiful sunset. And this is at Searston's Beach in the Codroy Valley. And if you have any photos you want to send to us, you can always do so at nlphotos at nlphotos at cbc.ca. Oh, that is just beautiful. Thanks so much, Harrison, for that gorgeous pic. And thank you, Heather. Thank you. Well, the inquiry into the treatment of Innu children in the child protection system starts formal hearings today in Labrador. It's investigating the deaths of six children who were either in care or died shortly after being in care. Here now is Heidi Adder is in Chetajit for the hearings. So Heidi, what's happening there today? So today and all this week, the inquiry commissioners are digging into the history of child welfare in the Innu communities in Labrador. They're looking at past and present practices as well as the health and well-being of the Innu. Now there are lawyers here from the federal government, provincial government, inquiry, Innu nation and more. And these are very different than the past community sessions where any Innu were invited to come and speak and share their perspective. Now lawyers are questioning witnesses so that they can present their evidence to commissioners. Okay, and who did commissioners hear from today? So today the commissioners heard from Mary Pia Benuin. Now she was the first Innu nurse in Labrador and one of the uh, in, integral people behind the Maniashini Clinic here in Chajit. Now she shared about her own personal history, her father's fight to keep her and her siblings in their community, in their culture, in their language, but also the challenges that she faced when going to first day school and then school outside of the community as well. She went on to share about what it was like to go to nursing school and, uh, and the racism and discrimination that Innu people faced in healthcare and her tr battles to try and fight that as a nurse and try to fight to get Innu people proper care. So who else do we expect to hear from this week? So this week, as we dig into this history of CSSD, we're going to be also hearing from the social health uh, director in Chajit, along with multiple social workers who work in the community. They're going to be talking about the past practices and uh, the current protocols, how things have changed over the years and what needs to change more in the future, as many Innu hope that this inquiry and its recommendations will result in Innu taking over over their own child protection systems. Well, thanks so much for this, Heidi. That's here and now's Heidi Adder reporting in Shahajit. No wonder that there was a lineup down or down Duckworth Street from the LSPU Hall. Kmart told them. Pot belly, potato bug, we're about to bring you a blast from local grunge bands past. They were the youngsters behind the 90s music scene in St. John's, a special feature documentary just ahead.
The 90s was a time of uncertainty and turbulence for some. Many were leaving the province in search of opportunities elsewhere, but young people growing up in the suburbs in and around St. John's were coming together to create a scene all their own, one that was gritty and produced a ton of music. Tonight, video producer Mark Cumby brings us a special three-part documentary about that time called On the Edge. Fun, fun in a recording studio. How I like to hear that RF interference. There's not a lot to do here except play music and have a good time, you know. Yeah, you know, unemployment breeds creativity. You know, when Friday came around, it wasn't like, oh, what are we going to do? It was just like, okay, what, who's playing at the hall tonight? This is Fred, Fred Gamberg, that is. We are just listening to uh, material from Potbelly, and as well, we heard a song by Hardship Post. Back in the early 90s, our whole scene was built around hanging around together downtown and postering, postering, postering. We'd make posters this big, and we'd get one in the window of Fred. You'd walk by a pole and say, oh, Potbelly or Lisbon are playing, oh, we'll go to that. Just when that, you know, Seattle thing was just affecting, like, the radio and stuff, there was this whole amazing scene that was happening here. In the early 90s, a culmination of things happened. The Peace Accord had been happening for a number of years and the all ages scene had been building. You know, at the time, you know, the outlook, I guess, was not great for Newfoundland either. You know, there was a lot of people leaving and, and you know, it was, it was an outlet. In the early 90s, Nirvana Nevermind happened. And what had been a vibrant underground scene at that particular point um, exploded in 1992, 93. So all the kids from the suburbs came down looking for that type of music. And it just so happened that a core number of bands, five, five or six bands, had existed and were playing that music. It was the LSPO Hall, was the, the shit hot place to be, uh, to play music, because that's where everyone went. It seemed like every weekend there was a show there. That's what I lived for. I loved going and playing at the hall. This was like rock and roll. This was like really organic and free. The LSPU Hall used to have all ages shows at that time. Uh, and a lot of people would show up for that. A lot of people my age and younger and a little bit older. And that's where Pop Belly played, Hardship Post, the Liz Band, uh, Who Defunk It. Uh, that, th those were the bands that I would start seeing bong uh, when, I, when I started going downtown more. Those, those were the bands that kind of influenced me. Who wouldn't go to a bong show and like go, oh my god, that was a rock and roll moment there, or oh my god, or, you know, Phil Winters, you know what I mean? You know, he's one of the best guitar players in town, if you ask me, from Newfoundland, because he's got his own sounds, you know? They had their kind of trancey rock and roll heavy riffs, they were just hypnotic. Good music to me kind of came with with skateboarding, uh, like punk rock and and metal and and all that stuff. And and I met a few other 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 band uh, other people at high school that wanted to be playing music that I I uh, wanted to. We started a band in in high school. It was mostly like high school band wars, bad battle to bands that we played. I'm sure everybody kind of goes through that kind of initial thing before. Doing before playing in the downtown circuit because you're underage, you you don't know where you're, you're playing for your friends really uh, at first at parties and and uh, and and high school high school shows. So. 
grade six, I started taking lessons. Uh, my friend, his brother, Rich Spurl, was a drummer, and uh, he taught me how to read, showed me how to use the sticks and the kit, and then from there on, I just took off. Artificial Joy, that started up, I got into grade 10, went to Bishop's College, and my sister was in grade 12, and so I met a couple of her friends that played music. So we were jamming, and Mike, the, the singer at the time, he wrote a song along with another student for their grad. Instead of like picking a normal grad song, they wrote and we recorded a grad song. We went up for two days to a studio in CBS. Rainbow Recording Studio. Not that great, but it'll do. Hold on, never mind. With Artificial Joy, we were, we were, we were a high school band. Uh, Mike Hancock, he started a show called In the Studio on Cable 9. Uh, he would get other bands in from different high schools and uh, on one of the shows uh, on In the Studio they had MDI and they had us, Artificial Joy, and uh, I, I think we all met because we did the recordings on the same day and that's where I really met Richie. That's how we started, we started jamming at the, at the Artificial Joy uh, rehearsal spot. We just like progressed into playing, wanting to be playing heavier music. And the music in, in Potato Bug was, was kind of like heavy grunge. We just really wanted to sound like what we were listening to at the time. And uh, I always hated the term grunge. So we, we always called it Sludge or Sludge Newfie. Kids were coming down in droves looking for the type of music that much music and popular culture was purposely pushing at them. Remember, like you could go to Kmart. Remember the Kmart Flyers? Grunge, grunge wear. No wonder that there was a lineup down, down Duckworth Street from the LSBU Hall. Kmart told them.
influenced by Liz, like, and still am. Mary thought it was love, but I thought it was lust. And it was Mary's balloon that got busted. Her style, it was just so amazing. Like, I just looked up to her intellectually. The stuff that I was writing about, I wasn't really writing about anything. It was just more, like, melodic and blah, blah, blah. Like, I, like I didn't really have, like, the force of a message of what she was saying. This is the show called On The Edge. Uh, we're just listening to uh, material from Potbelly. It's a track called Twister. My first band was Potbelly, which started in 1991, maybe. You know, I was hanging around downtown and was, you know, sort of plugging away at trying to learn bass myself. And then I'd seen Doug Jones's previous band. I'd heard that he and Rennie Squires, who used to go to shows all the time back then, uh, and Sterling Robertson were jamming. And I just said, I hear you're looking for a bass player. I'd love to try out. We did our first demo early 92, I think. I feel it coming on. We did that with Ward Pike at Jolly Roger Studios. You know, it was released on cassette. We home dubbed them and everything like that. I think, I think if you have one of those tapes, everybody's tape sounded different because we used like three different cassette decks. We dubbed the master from the DAT onto the cassettes, and every tape deck, of course, ran at a slightly different speed. So when you played it back on another tape deck, it sounded different. And we used uh, the cheapest tapes we could find, so they didn't exactly record real well. That worked out. Th that band evolved till it was just me and Doug and Tony Tucker playing. two years and the uh, the alternative scene here in St. John's has, uh, to put it mildly, exploded. Uh, how have you guys, uh, have you guys noticed a big change in the past two years? Uh, the crowd's been getting bigger and more enthusiastic? Yeah, Doug will feel that one. <laughs> uh, yeah, the crowd's been getting bigger for the last couple of years. When we first started, like, there was, you know, 15 people will come see us at Burnham and stuff. But uh, now we've turned, you know, there's like 200 people at just about every show. People seem to dig what we're doing, so. We did a full length cassette and a couple of split seven inches and a couple of comps in the upcoming years until I think it was 94 we broke up, I think. Doug ultimately uh, decided he didn't want to continue on and when you're in a three piece, if one person doesn't want to continue on, well, I guess that's the end of that band. And so then he went on to form uh, Sterling Slacks almost immediately. day or two days of Potbelly breaking up, Sterling Slacks and and uh, Potmaster started and that was basically like there was a band called Darshiva uh, that existed uh, as well right at that time uh, which was John Swires and John Fisher and Ivan Koff and, and Natalie Noseworthy. So then John Swires joined Doug and they formed Sterling Slacks and Natalie and John Fisher joined myself and Tony and we started Potmaster. came up with the name, it all made sense at the time. It wasn't like necessarily a reference to, to Peron or anything at the time, I don't think it was. I think it was more like a pot, like the chore boy logo and a pot on his head. I don't even know. The scene was just so alluring, I couldn't help myself. I just wanted to be part of it, it was just so cool. It was really organic and awesome, and the bands were awesome. And then all the people that would come to the shows, like everyone would just be hanging out at the War Memorial and Duckworth Lunch, like this cafe that was on the go. And I don't know, like I just wanted to like just <laughs> hang out downtown. And I don't know what made it so special then. 
but it was special. Now to get us rolling, we have our very own house band, and they are too cool. They've just released their first CD called Freak Me Out to the Deluxe, and man, they know how to do it. Please welcome the Bare Bones house band, Pop Master! <laughs> Master ever truly recorded was was uh, was the album Freak Me Out to the Deluxe, which was recorded by Ward Pike and Don Ellis in two separate sessions. Part of uh, the Potmaster record that we recorded with Don Ellis was recorded during the uh, Blackout '94. It like there was like four days of no power in downtown St. John's, and our jam space where we were recording was right in the heart of that. We're sitting at the jam space with a bunch of rented gear going like, oh my god, we're paying rental on all this gear and we can't even turn it on and start recording. We lost like half of our recording time to that. Listening back to the recording, I can hear Johnny's guitar in one ear and my guitar in the other. They totally clash, like in terms of what like we were doing, but I think when you put it all together, it just mushed together and it was like this really, it was heavy.
Butler. At the time, uh, our house was, um, you know, our bedroom and our jam room was all kind of one thing, and there was a door to the outside. It was basically in the basement of this house. And so there's a knock on the door, right? And so this is this guy with fuzzy long hair. He's like, hey, yeah, I heard you guys playing and stuff. And, you know, would you mind if I just kind of sat around and watched? We're like, yeah, sure, whatever, right? Mm-hmm. Anyway, it turns out it's Fred Gamberg, you know? So we had, of course, seen Fred at, at various shows because, you know, at the time he was the one who was organizing most of the shows. And he said, you know, you guys should, you guys should do a show. You guys should play this show. And we're like, what? Is this guy it's crazy, right? Like... Basically, if you said, I have a band, he would say, you're on first tomorrow night. He was this enigma that just lived at CHMR. Like, I ran a Sunday, I had a Sunday night radio show that was like the closing show of the night. Like, it started at 11 p.m. and I could play until, there was no one on after me, so I could play until whatever time I wanted. And then I would play the, the, the Ode to Newfoundland and sign off the radio and turn off the tape machines and leave. But more often than not, while I'd be in the middle of my show, Fred Gamberg would show up in the studio and just go like, I'll be asleep in the studio. Uh, let me know, wake me up when you're done and, uh, and all this broadcast afterwards. And so at like one in the morning, I'd finish my show, go wake up Fred and he'd just come in and start playing records after me until whoever came in at six in the morning, he'd be there all night. Welcome back everyone, it's now one minute past midnight up here at CHMR FM. This is Fred Gamberg, yes you can tell, can't you? The show is on the edge. And if you have uh, a request, uh, problems with uh, your coffee maker, whatever, call me 737-7935 and uh, I'll see if you really hear what I say on the air. On a hot, hazy summer day, the big river in Flat Rock hardly lives up to its name. Little more than a trickle right now, the river still has its attractions, especially for kids looking for a spot to cool off. Like this pool, where teenagers jump from the cliff into roughly 15 feet of water. It's all in a day's fun, but last night was another story. The RNC say a group of young people was swimming here around 11.30 last night, when one of them, 24-year-old Fred Gamberg of St. John's, went missing. Divers recovered his body at around 5.30 this morning. I never really knew anybody who died before. It was shocking because everybody knew him, you know, and he was like, he was that guy. He was always there. It started like the scales tipped a little bit. Like it started, you could just feel things changing a little bit. It was a never to see him after he passed away. And when he died, it, like you, you just felt the whole scene just like the whole scene died. I think that had a huge effect on on what was happening in that scene. I mean, you know, you can even go far as to say that, you know, maybe, <laughs> you know, it was because of him that it was so big, you know, in a way, that it got so big. It seemed like everything kind of fell in place that, like, Fred died, Kurt Cobain died, <laughs> right? And, um, and like, bands were, were breaking up as well. It was, it, it was a lot of things that, that, that kind of was, was, was the culprit of of, of kind of the, the dying scene. Uh, at some point, the Ellis Pugh Hall stopped doing the all-ages shows. The theater scene got its shit together and realized we were in their way, and Fred dying at that time as well, and us sort of moving on to more bar shows uh, led to the halls are sort of being reclaimed by the theater community, in many ways rightfully so. Fred Gamberg represents a particular time and a particular place in Newfoundland underground music. I think what what Fred did was give a lot of people who wouldn't have had that opportunity um, otherwise a vehicle to express themselves and to get on stage as young people. And that's, that's what Fred represents, the empowerment of, of youth culture. We 
had a chance to play like big venues and different like, from from doing this uh, from being in that band it was it was a good trip to 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 go through all that and experience like the 90s uh, era with the all ages shows with all the big crowds and coming to the shows we we kept playing and we were playing at the peace accords and and uh eventually just kept playing until brian moved i think brian ended up moving to calgary afterwards we never really broke up it was just like hi hiatus because someone moved out of the province and came back and so we're back together again oh someone's working uh, offshore so we're whatever but and and we all had like different focus or different interests as well like we formed other bands the brian was in different bands jamie played in different bands i played different bands so um as as potato bug was on the side you know like we we would do our own thing and eventually we'd come back and do reunion shows <laughs> feels like it's a it's like a family coming back together again to do a family reunion you, you still have fans that are that still kind of listen to the music or or like know of of that we've existed as a as potato bug you know for us we all got busy like you know we some of us had kids and and uh, you know we got real jobs and but yeah you know we were totally everyone was all in you know it was like you know yep we're doing it happen again let's make the 90s happen again <laughs> it was really fun to break up those riffs again and play them again with those people it's a mutual experience that a lot of people you know and as in this town have and are connected by, and I still see people who are at those shows. At that Popmaster reunion show, a guy in the front row, he was like, you're the reason why I'm playing in a band now, and he plays in the band Allagash. There are bands in this town today playing because those kids at age 14 came to the LSPU hall and saw Popmaster wearing, you know, stupid outfits, blasting crazy light shows, and swamping the place in smoke machines and strobe lights while we played weird grungy metal. That brings back a lot of memories for some folks out there. Thanks again to the CBC's Mark Cumbie for that documentary. And before we leave you tonight, we want to tell you about a story coming up on The National. Chief Correspondent Adrian Arsenault is speaking with Dr. Yasser Khan, the ophthalmologist recently returned from a 10-day surgical mission in South Gaza, helping hundreds of people who've been injured by bombings. He tells Adrian what he saw, how people in southern Gaza are coping, and what it was like coming home. Was it harder to go there or harder to come back? It was definitely harder to come back. I never thought I'd be saying this, but it was harder to come back. Will I see them again? I don't know. And to come back to a very privileged life, peace, stability, security, which we take for granted, um, yeah, I felt my heart actually is still there. Physically, I'm here, but my heart's still there. 
And you can catch that full interview tonight on the National. That's 930 Island Time, a half an hour earlier in most parts of Labrador. So thanks, Heather, for filling in for Ashley again tonight. You'll be here tomorrow as well. And a quick recap of what's in store. So much cold weather. Speaking of Labrador, uh, really bundle up uh, tomorrow in uh, northern Labrador. Going to be very, very cold with that extreme cold warning. All right. Well, that's it for us. Thank you so much for spending part of your evening with us. Good night.